Welcome to Machine Learning. This class is uh, CS5350, CS6350, and DS4350. Uh, it's cross-listed across multiple sections. And usually in the first lecture, people like to talk about logistics or start with logistics. Um, I really don't want to because it's boring. Um, instead, I'm going to start with uh, just this question. What is machine learning? This is the question that we're going to try to answer today and for the rest of the semester. And we'll see that every time we answer this question, we'll get an order. Well, not today, but our goal today and through the semester is what is learning? And especially of the machine kind. Let's uh, start with a game though. Um, this game is uh, called the badges game. Um, every time you attend a conference, I don't know how many of you have attended conferences, but if you attend conferences, what you'll see is that uh, at the beginning, you need to go to the registration desk and sign up. And what they will do is give you a badge with your name on it. That's what happened in uh, the 1994 conference on uh, machine learning. This was uh, at that time, this conference had 290-ish, about 300 attendees. This was the premier conference for machine learning. And everyone got a badge with their name and affiliation, but every badge also had a plus or a minus. Um, this person reportedly uh, was the co-organizer of the conference that year, and he knew the, the, the process that generated the pluses and the minuses. And the thing, the, the information that was given to all the attendees was the, the sign that's associated with your name depends only on your name and nothing else. It's not like depends on your height or whatever. So it's based on the name. Card. And the task for all the attendees was go around the conference, talk to people, see their names, and try to figure out what was the magic function that I used, he used, uh, to assign the pluses or minuses. I think this was supposed to be an icebreaker of some sort because you know people who do computer science were back in the day, you'll never guess, but back in the day, people who did computer science were notoriously shy. Uh, and not anymore, no, no, no. <laughs> so uh, the idea was you go to uh, you know, hang out, talk to people, you try to figure out what their names are, and at the same time, try to guess the function without being too weird about looking at the name tag. So that's the game we are gonna play. I'm not gonna give you name tags. I don't know all your names yet. I hope to, one of my goals for this semester is to know all your names. Um, but uh, some of the rules that could have been used were things like, you know, if the second letter of the first name is a vowel, then the label's a plus, otherwise it's a minus. That, by the way, was the rule that was used in that conference. Or it could be if the first name is last, longer than last name and so on. So now the, your task is to play this game. So let's say that uh, you see a few of these names. Claire Cardi has the, uh, a plus and Peter Bartlett, these are the two people you've met in the conference so far. And Peter Bartlett has a minus. Question for you. What do you think was the function that I used? By the way, this is not the same as the function that was used in the conference. I just made this up about two hours ago. So question for you is what was the function that was used to label these names. These are the only two people you've met in the conference so far. Anyone wants to take a guess? Yes. That's a good guess, right? The first letter of the first name matches the first letter of the last name, then it's a plus, otherwise it's a minus. So by this definition, um, I have a time her would get a plus, everyone else would get a minus. Any other thoughts, any other functions? Yes. I did not count the length, but I'm willing to bet you're right um, that it works for Claire and Cardi. Um, so again, according to that, Eric Baum would be a plus and the others would be a minus. So there are of course other functions you can think about, right? Um, like you can keep inventing these things. You could say things like, if the day of the week is a Tuesday and the first person, the first name of the person um, has, uh, I don't know, some letter in common with the day of the week or something, you know, it doesn't, you can make up arbitrarily complicated rules. The 
question for you really is how do you know you're right? You can invent any number of these sort of rules, but how do you know you're right? You could say maybe, yeah, this is just two names. How do you like, how can anyone know what's right? All right. I'll give you more names. By the way, using this, you should be able to assign names to labels to any names. Right. So according to the rules that you said, both the rules that were suggested, uh, Indiana Jones becomes a minus. Um, is that right? Uh, I probably got your rules right. So Indiana Jones becomes a minus for both those rules. But uh, maybe this is just too few names. So here is more. Okay, I've given you more data. Okay. Do you want to update your guesses? You walked around the conference and you saw more names. Yes. Uh, is it number of vowels so that there's an even or an odd number of vowels in the first name? Is that right? Can someone else verify? Because uh, um, now it probably matches the first two names, right? Yes. If there is a C, oh wow. Oh, no, uh, there is a C here. Yes. But, oh, by the way, uh, this class is also live streamed on Zoom. So the people on Zoom, if you have suggestions or questions, uh, you're welcome to uh, type it out and I'll read it for the class. Uh, one more, uh, someone who's not answered so far, you've not answered. Uh, for some of these names, first name starts with a letter that is E or earlier. Maybe you're right. You're, it, I think in this case, in, on, in these examples, you're right. Um, but the question is really, uh, how do you know you're right? Sure, these six names, but remember, I made up this function two hours ago. What, you're, what I'm asking you to do is read my mind from two hours ago using these six examples. So, but the, the, the cool thing is, if you are able to do that right, you can assign a label to any name, even names that don't exist. Well, uh, it could be any word, silly. Right. So, if you get the function right, you get the you're, you get the ability to assign these names to labels to any names. How do you know you're right? If you feel like you want to spend a bit more time on this, the entire data is available on the class website. There are two hundred and ninety-four names with labels on them. I welcome you to uh, take a look at them and guess how the labels were created. Um, and uh, you know, you can come back to me, you can come back on Thursday and uh, tell me what the function was. Now, you may think this is kind of a silly exercise, but in fact, this is in uh, like in the gist of it, this is a kernel of what we expect machine learning algorithms to do. There is some hidden function somewhere. Some guy probably made up that function or maybe nature made up that function. And we want to see a few examples of that function in action. And we would like to know, we would like to kind of discover the mind of nature. So what is machine learning? I have been kind of beating around the bush. What is machine learning? Oh. Um, let me kind of waffle a little more. You probably have heard the phrase somewhere. You're here in the class, right? I mean, you it's not like you just threw darts at the catalog and decided to show up in the class. Maybe you did, but uh, you probably have seen machine learning somewhere. You are definitely already using it, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not. It's, um, you know, it's recommending things to, for you to buy. It's translating things for you. It's recognizing things in your photographs, people and objects and such things. Um, for better or worse, your digital assistants rely on machine learning, whether they work or not is a different question. They don't work for me ever. Uh, but for sure, you're using a spam detector. Your email inbox, you probably don't see most of the email that is sent to you. Why? Because there is a learning-based system that is sitting there and filtering, tossing out messages that are garbage. It's in places that you may not obviously recognize. Uh, there's a whole industry of algorithmic trading that is built 
uh, with very, 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 very fast computers and very, 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 very complicated machine learning algorithms. Um, and they move around billions of dollars all the time. A more simple sort of down to earth example involves the postal service. You can write your, uh, you can write addresses on envelopes and you mail them. And there are certain learning based systems that can recognize characters and try to sort the, uh, the what do you call them, where things go. Sometimes this works. Um, one of the drivers of a lot of uh, you know online companies to, uh, today is machine learning because they rely on selling ads and deciding which ad to show and where to put the ad, whom to show what ad and when is uh, typically done by learning algorithms or learned programs. Um, I don't read Dutch, but there are times when I want to read a Dutch website. I don't know why. Um, I can go to Google Translate and Google Translate is a or any pick your favorite translate. I don't necessarily endorse or oppose other translation engines. Um, and they tend to do a surprisingly good job. And they are one of the uh, stellar successes of machine learning. Um, I think one of the more exciting places where machine learning shows up is in uh, sort of moving science forward. There's a lot of work on discovering things like markers for uh, various diseases in the genes our uh, 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 DeepMind, uh, 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 Google subsidiary, had this program that uh, is called Alpha Fold, which takes a protein string, you know, a protein uh, formula, if you will, and convert and she tells you what the 3D structure of the protein should be. And uh, that is like truly a revolutionary um, uh, advance to the point where Science Magazine, no, uh, Time Magazine, not the uh, necessarily the biggest uh, scientific journal out there, but yeah, take it as you will, called this the biggest, one of the biggest advances of 2022. Uh, and it's, you know, the, I'm sure you have, you can come up with other examples as well. When I first taught this class almost 10 years ago, I had to tell people, oh, there are these cool applications of machine learning. You may not have heard of this thing, but machine learning is cool. Now you probably already use it. But what is this machine learning? What is learning? Let's again go back to this thing about uh, define, trying to define machine learning. What is machine learning? Maybe one of the first instances of the phrase machine learning in an academic paper came from uh, came in this paper, uh, paper by Arthur Samuel about uh, playing the game of checkers. Um, it's really a cool paper. I would recommend you read it. This paper was written in 1959 before all of us were born, yes. And uh, the, the, it uses the phrase machine learning in a way that is recognizable to us today. Samuel writes uh, that programming uh, computers, if, if computers could learn from experience, then it would eliminate the need for programming effort. Uh, and he goes through this uh, really nice uh, exercise of trying to teach a program to play checkers in two different ways. And he talks about the difference between rote learning or just memorization and generalization. We'll talk about this difference a lot in the semester. The key to machine learning, key to learning of any kind, machine or human is generalization. I really hope that at the end of the semester, you learn to generalize from what I say. You know, you get to interact with me for uh, what one semester that's a handful of lectures, but I want you to go and do things that are that I can't even dream about. Good things, good things, always good things. <laughs> um, and uh, that requires generalization, going beyond what you see in a classroom, going beyond what you see in a lecture. In this case, in Samuel's case, going beyond what is seen in uh, uh, the few training instances, games of checkers that uh, uh, he showed. Um, the abstract, I don't know if you can read it, so I can try to zoom in, says enough work has been done to verify the fact that a computer can be programmed so that it will learn to play a getter, better game of checkers than the, played by the person who wrote the program. Basically, that means Samuel lost the game. He played checkers with this program and he lost and he just wrote a paper about it. Um, 
uh, it's kind of interesting also to note that this was, as I said, written in 1959, when computers didn't look anything like what we have. Today, we carry around like really powerful computers in our pockets. At that time, uh, you need a really big pocket to carry around the computers because uh, they were as big as rooms. They were, they had, this was before uh, we had electronic computers of the kind that we think about. It was all vacuum tubes and um, it's a different world. Yet he was able to conclude that as a result of these experiments where he lost the game, uh, one can say with some clarity, with certainty that learning would be uh, economically feasible for real life problems. Talk about being visionary. This was uh, a good lifetime away and he was, this is really cool. Um, but one of the you know, key ideas he discusses in the paper is the notion that learning is about generalization. It's about being able to do well the next time. Uh, Herbert Simon wrote uh, this paper in 1983. Actually, this was a talk he gave in 1979 um, to an audience at Carnegie Mellon where he tried to argue at the beginning of the talk that why do we need learning? Why should machines learn? It was a very clever talk. He starts off the talk by saying, I don't think machines need to learn. At the end of the talk, he says, yeah, I think they need to learn. Um, and then this talk was written up as a paper and uh, he defines this uh, somewhere in the middle. He asks the question, so what's learning? And he says, learning denotes changes in a system that are adaptive in the sense that they enable the system to do better at the task or they enable the system to do the task or another task drawn from the same population more effectively the next time. This is a uh, like an important point. Being able to do a task better the next time means requires some sort of adaptivity because if you imagine that you write a program, let's say you write a program to play tic-tac-toe. It plays tic-tac-toe once, does something. The next time you run the program, it's not going to get better. The program doesn't adapt. The program doesn't change. It's whatever you encoded is in the program. What Herbert Simon is arguing uh, is that the program should adapt so that if the same task has to be done again, maybe the same game of tic-tac-toe, or another task from the same population, a different game or with a different person, it should be more effective. Effective is a loose word. Effective could mean faster, Effective could mean more uh, correct, better, or however you want to define it. And uh, I like this quote, uh, the, this phrase that shows up in the paper, old programs don't learn, they simply fade away. Herbert Simon is, uh, was a polymath. He was a force of nature. He's the only person of our species to have ever received both a Nobel Prize and a Turing Award. So, you know, maybe he knew something. <laughs> Um, perhaps a more well-formed definition for machine learning shows up in this textbook uh, by Tom Mitchell, who is faculty at CMU, who said, a computer program is set to learn from some experience E, just any experience, with respect to a collection of tasks T and a performance measure P, if its performance in the tasks improves as measured according to P, uh, improves with the experience uh, E. It's a lot of letters, a lot of uh, like it's a complicated sentence. Let me break it down. Imagine that your program gets to interact with the world or with data in some form. Call that experience. Your self-driving car, if you have one, could have the experience of driving around on the streets. Your tic-tac-toe player, uh, its experience would be playing tic-tac-toe. Your badges game player, its experience would be going around the conference and accumulating more names. So experience is essentially measured in terms of how much data is the program going to encounter. And Mitchell says, it's not enough to just say that your program improves with experience. There must be a specific collection of tasks. Your tic-tac-toe player or your badges game program should not be asked to drive a car. That, that seems so stupid to say, but you know, there is a particular task that the program does, and that's the task that we care about. And it's not just enough to say, 
here's the task I care about. We need to specify what is success. How do we measure um, the performance of the program? The number of games it wins or the number of names it gets right the, for the badges or for self-driving cars, the metric is a little bit trickier. Um, I don't want to make a very dark joke right now. So let's just say it gets trickier. Um, so, uh, but we need to have a, a one or more well-defined collections of uh, definition of uh, performance. And a program is said to learn as uh, if, as it encounters more experience, more data, its performance according to that collection, of, uh, that particular collection of metrics, performance measures P, increases. Up is better. This is a, about as close as a well-formed definition to machine learning that we will encounter. Um, it still does not give us any sense of how do we convert this one sentence into an algorithm, but we'll see other definitions that allow us to, you know, actually just derive algorithms from the definition. But the most important point here is that learning is generalization. Learning is not about memorization. Imagine that you had a program that looked at these nine photographs and uh, identified that, uh, or, or, or it was told that these nine collections of uh, pixels are all dogs. It's perhaps not particularly exciting if tomorrow you expect the program to say that um, this thing here, this thing here is a dog. But because you know you already know that it's a dog, what you want is that the program should generalize. It should look at something completely different, completely out there, and also label this as a dog. I think that's a dog. I could be wrong. So learning is all about generalization. And that's really the most important lesson for today. Um, it, it's not about just doing the same task, you know, repeatedly doing the thing that you did before. Um, well, again, I just realized uh, people at the far end near the wall there might be farther from me than people at this far end. Can you still hear me? Okay, awesome. Thank you. If you can't hear me, please just shout out. I don't know if you can't hear me, if I'll hear you, but so just wave or something. Um, also, uh, if there are questions, if there are suggestions, if there are comments, if you have any thoughts to share, please, um, please raise your hand. Um, I think I might be biased, call me biased. I think machine learning is the future. It's the future of programming for sure, because it, it endows programs and computers with this like unbelievably cool ability. It allows programs to perform tasks in situations that we have never encountered before. It's a new way to think about programming. Traditionally, when we think about programming, we write the instructions to the computer, the computer follows the instructions. Here, we are not giving instructions to a computer to, of what to do. Instead, the instructions are how to learn to do the next task. So the, in some sense, what, we will, what learning algorithms will do is they will allow programs to go out and acquire new capabilities. And this, this ability to acquire new capability or new, um, new uh, function is something that is necessary for programs to interact with messy data, with noisy input. Uh, and you know, as a result, it's not surprising that machine learning has made inroads into all sorts of user-facing applications. Yes? Is there any area where you're less optimistic about no. Machine learning. And it'd be a little tricky with say formal reasoning. Yes, uh, that's uh, oh, okay, good. So you're talking about areas of computer science. I'm thinking, I was thinking of, you know, laying the road and such things. But um, yeah, so uh, interesting that you say that formal reasoning. Um, there are efforts that I'm aware of on trying to learn to reason. Um, it these are proof of proofs of concept. And they actually work at least inside those toy worlds. Um, there are also there are also you know computational limits, and we will see this. There are computational limits to what can be learned. There are computational limits to um, how much data you need to encounter to actually learn something. Um, I'll give you a simple example. Imagine that I have 
uh, random number generator, a perfect random number generator. Suppose I toss a coin. Uh, it's about as perfect as I can think of. And I keep tossing coins, and the program's experience is every time I toss a coin, it sees heads or tails. And its job is to get better at predicting whether the next toss will be a head or a tail. It's not going to happen. Randomness cannot be learned. Machine learning is about detecting regularity in data. So truly random things cannot be learned. So that's one limitation. Um, I'll come to you, both of you in a minute. Another thing that can't be learned is there are certain concepts that are so tricky that they require more data or more compute than is reasonably possible. We will see, this is a, I'm, I'm giving you a very loose statement right now, but uh, we will see a formal version of this later on. Certain things just cannot be learned. In fact, uh, uh, certain things cannot be learned unless you make rather drastic assumptions. Um, so the this is where things kind of break down. It's not, I'm kind of uh, jumping forward to the very last lecture of the semester, but I'll say it anyway. Machine learning is not a panacea. It's not like a magic wand that you're going to use to fix. Uh, every time I don't know how to write a program, I'm going to click a button and it'll do my homework for me. No, that's not going to work. Uh, but there are many things it can. Uh, I don't know who raised the very last so Yeah. Um, how, so in case people didn't hear the question, the question was, how do we know that the program is generalizing and not memorizing? And the answer is we test them. We test the program on unseen, so unseen inputs. The standard experimental setup for all machine learning papers and uh, in, in any sort of deployment should be, you train your system on some data. And when you test it, you should make sure you do not test it on the data that it saw. Because if you did, then your program will cheat. It will just memorize everything and you know it's uh, it'll just get a perfect score. So uh, the way to know that it generalizes is by careful experimental setup. And this is where machine learning moves from a solid uh, mathematical uh, problem to something that is actually empirical. We have to have a good experimental setup. Yes. Uh, one program is one cost example. So you said it was random. Uh -huh. This would be better than put up to the physics, but I keep calling it. Yeah, that's why I kind of, uh, yeah, I, I, I knew you would say that. I, not you, but I knew somebody would say that. Yes, uh, you know, the, there is some, maybe there's like a little bit of speck of dust that makes one side a little heavier and that shows up a little more. And maybe your learning program will latch on to that. But chances are that will have there's so much noise that it will miss it. Um, yes, um, uh, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of whether coin tosses are truly random. I would like to believe they are. Uh, otherwise, it totally ruins all sports. Um, but uh, to a first approximation, let's pretend that coin tosses are random. Other questions? I do want to kind of restate that uh, this perspective that I hold dear, which is the a program that is able to learn actually can be seen as a program that acquires new capabilities. And as a result, we are writing programs that write programs, well, that acquire new functionality. And uh, th this is a very uh, useful sort of perspective because because of this perspective, machine learning is widely used and there are so many different fields where it's immediately applied. Um, the, at least when I encountered it, I saw machine learning as a subfield of artificial intelligence. Um, I've been working in some version of machine learning for almost 15 years now. Back then, it was one of those classes that you would take because the art, some other class you wanted was full. Uh, uh, that's not always the case now. Uh, but artificial intelligence is different from machine learning. AI is the grander goal of you know, computers that are as intelligent as humans, whatever that means. Machine learning is very closely related to it. It has empowered a lot of the advances in AI that we hear about and a lot of the, some of the bad stuff as well. Um, 
but uh, specifically machine learning is the primary driver behind uh, improvements in the subfields of AI like natural language processing or computer vision or robotics and such things where the, the data that our programs encounter like sentences or documents or images, videos, um, you know, trying to grasp things, uh, all of those, that kind of data is inherently noisy. There's going to be, uh, it's noisy, it's extremely complicated. It's hard for any human to write down rules that will kind of drive the program. It's better to write a program to write those rules. And that's why machine learning is like successful there. Um, historically, learn, machine learning, the field is, has also been very intimately connected with theoretical computer science and mathematics. Why? Because one of the big advances that happened uh, around the mid 80s uh, and actually the 90s also was um, trying to formalize learning mathematically. And being able to formalize learning mathematically led to uh, new, you know, a, more robust learning algorithms, which actually drive all the advances we think about today. And uh, along the way, this needed ideas from probability and statistics, linear algebra, theory of computation, basically all the prerequisites for this class. There are connections to philosophy. I mean, we can philosophize about the concept of learning all of all the time, and sometimes that philosophy is not idle. Um, there's connections to psychology, there's connections to neuroscience, linguistics, you know, a lot of fields. And these are all different. These are uh, all the areas that I listed on top till here are areas from which machine learning, as we know it today, has derived ideas from. But then its applications go back into many, many areas. AI both gives into machine learning and takes from it. So as I said, like a lot of machine learning uh, AI advances today are because of learning. There are applications in medicine, engineering, uh, technology, marketing. Uh, what did I put there? Medi medicine again. Uh, there are like, you know, uh, the dot, dot, dot is probably longer than any list that I can come up with. Um, and I always kind of feel amazed about one thing, which is every time I teach this class, there are at least a few people in this class who have absolutely no intellectual connection to some others. There's a certain amount of like uniqueness to every individual because there's like a lot of intellectual diversity. And this, that's, I, I would like to think, I mean, this is maybe I'm being very uh, optimistic here. I would like to think it's because of the diversity of all the topics that machine learning touches that we see uh, very, very different and interesting people in machine learning classes. Are there any questions? Uh, I can keep talking, but are there questions? Any questions on Zoom? One of the problems with teaching a class at or around lunchtime is uh, the questions tend to be a bit thin. Um, I don't know how I can help that. Okay, um, if there are no questions, I'm going to jump into what I think of as like an over overview of this course. Given what we said so far, or given what I said so far and what we discussed so far, um, I'm going to continue in this way. The main question for this entire semester is, what is learning? And we will answer this question in many different formal ways. And different formal answers to this question will give us different learning algorithms, actually different families of learning algorithms, and uh, uh, interesting insights into creating um, uh, new learning algorithms. There's a question on Zoom. Um, Jim asks, when talking about machine learning, do we touch upon the uh, ethical ramifications such as using machine learning for art generation? We will touch upon, there will be a unit at the end of the semester on the ethics of machine learning. It's an extremely important uh, topic. Uh, it's kind of connected to the ethics of data science, but I think not identical. One of the ethical questions, uh, I think Jim asks about using machine learning for art generation. Um, I don't find myself uh, 
qualified to talk about art at all. Um, but I do know about text generation. I do know about homeworks. And there are programs that can do homeworks for you. Please don't use them. There is an ethical problem there. We will cover that ethical problem in the class. And so that's like this recursive thing. Um, but in general, we will have a unit at the end of the semester on the ethics of machine learning about um, how uh, the data that we use to train these models can be biased and it can lead to interesting biases of all kinds. How the use of machine learning and automation that it drives introduces, um, shall we say, interesting and complicated societal changes um, that I'm sure you're you can think of some right away. But uh, I want to keep that for the end of the semester, mostly because I don't want to start with uh, you know, finger wagging and warning. Uh, I would like to keep that at the end, where by that time, you would have the context for what, uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Jim. Um, it's going to take some time to type. So or, uh, are there other questions? I'll, so, I, I'm going to talk about what we will cover in the class and uh, we'll kind of get into this sort of specific topics as we go along. So along the way, when we see all these formal answers and various algorithms, what we'll see, uh, we'll see different kinds of models, different learning protocols, different learning algorithms. Um, we'll see this uh, wonderful field called computational learning theory, which uh, you may not encounter in other classes. And there will be this sort of an undercurrent of a question about how do we represent data in a way that makes it easy to learn. Let's kind of dive into this a little bit more one at a time. We'll see different kinds of models. And I put models in quotes because uh, that word means many different things depending on the context. Uh, here, what I mean is the function that a learning algorithm discovers in uh, the badges game, the model was a simple if else statement. Um, we will encounter decision trees. We'll encounter, spend a bit of time talking about linear classifiers and linear regressors, because these are like these nice toy examples that allow us to build the theory and the algorithms and the experience needed to get into more complicated things like neural networks and such things. We will encounter neural networks, uh, which are like a primary driver of a lot of uh, uh, machine learning related stuff today. And we'll spend some time talking about ensembles of classifiers where we don't train one classifier, we just train a committee and ask them all to vote. And what is amazing is that uh, sometimes in certain conditions, we can prove that the committee will always do better than any one of them, which is just uh, crazy. But we'll see all of this uh, and each of these will occupy a good part of uh, uh, the semester. There are many different kinds of learning protocols out there. Uh, I'll briefly uh, you know, tell you about what they are and tell you what we won't do in the semester. There is this idea called supervised learning, where a teacher supplies a collection of examples to the learner or the student, and the learner has to learn, to learn a function that labels new examples using the rule that the teacher used or using the function that the teacher used. Essentially, the uh, learner has to discover a good approximation of the teacher's state of mind. Um, how many of you, it's, it's possible that uh, uh, some of you have used supervised learning at some point. How many, uh, yes, you have, or do you have a question? Uh, we talked about this in a course. Uh, this is uh, the foundations of, yes. So, uh, and it's not just that you might have used, even if you've not taken that uh, prerequisite, you may have seen uh, supervised learning, uh, you know, in other places, we, maybe not with that name. Uh, there is the, uh, the unsu there is this other version, there's an other extreme called unsupervised learning, where there's no teacher. The program is just told, go figure. Uh, it, you know, it's just given a collection of data and said, and you, you tell it, yeah, there's some pattern in the data, discover it. And maybe it gets the right pattern, maybe it gets the wrong pattern, but unsupervised learning is intimately connected to data mining. There's, a, you know, somewhere in between lies semi-supervised learning where there's a teacher, but the teacher doesn't bother to label everything. 
And so some examples are labeled and some examples are not. And the learner has to use both collections of examples or data to figure out what's going on. Active learning is super interesting. Active learning is where the learner and the teacher interact with each other, as I might hope you do with me. And the teacher teaches, the learner is allowed to ask questions, all kinds of questions. Now, what is amazing is that uh, the, in certain uh, formalized settings, we can show that active learning is perhaps more efficient than anything else. Why? Because the learner actually asks questions about what they want, what they uh, don't understand. This is my way of saying, please feel free to ask questions. There's also reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is where the learner, does, there's no teacher really, but uh, the learner kind of interacts with an environment and figures out what to do next. It figures out a policy of how to interact, how to uh, behave. Um, a, a famous example of reinforcement learning is uh, where uh, this program was taught or basically played the game of Go again and again and figured out how to play Go so well that it beat the world champion. Uh, that was an example of reinforcement learning. In this class, given that we have only what one semester, we will almost entirely focus on supervised learning and go into quite a bit of detail about various components of it. If time permits, and I really, really hope it does, we will touch upon unsupervised learning a bit. And there are other classes where you can pick up other things. Active learning, for some reason, is never taught in a class. I can recommend a book. Uh, um, or some papers if you want. Questions? Questions about any of these things? Yes? How is the In unsupervised learning, the learner does not get to interact with an environment. Think of the, and when I say environment, think of it as like a simulator. Or uh, imagine that there is a car. In the beginning, the car doesn't know what to do. And then it has some internal random model of what to do. It uses that model, drives around, does all sorts of damage. And then from that damage, it figures out, oh, I should not be doing that. And then it updates its model. And then using the new model, it kind of goes around and does its thing. Um, there isn't enough world out there to let us, uh, you know, let loose a car and train it that way. But you can do that in simulators. So often reinforcement learning is done with a simulator. Uh, there's an it's it's game playing uh, uh, sort of setting. In unsupervised learning, the learner does not get to inter. So, in reinforcement learning, the learner interacts with the world and can harvest examples. So, if I need to learn how to walk, for example, I can choose to walk here and figure out how to turn. I can by the choices that I make decides what data I get in reinforcement learning. In unsupervised learning, there's nothing of that sort. There is a collection of data. The learner just does what it does with it. It does not get to interact or ask for more data or request more information of any kind. Yes. What does that mean? Okay. So that uh, the, the, that comes usually under reinforcement learning. When you anytime you have this sort of a uh, uh, learning from a reward, where you know how bad you played is a reward, it falls into this reinforcement learning type umbrella. Yes. So Possibly, yeah, that's a uh, that's a reasonable approximation. Yes, active learning essentially requires uh, allows you to interact with a teacher who can give specific answers. Yes, yeah. First off, can you explain that the teacher is infallible? No. Okay. And second off, are we going to cover things like? More advanced topics that probably transform a couple of I knew this question is coming. Let me answer the first question first. Do we assume that the teacher is infallible? Absolutely not. You should not assume that any teacher of yours is infallible, um, self-included. Um, 
And the, 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 this is actually a cool technical question. How do you train a model when the feature is noisy? And there's a really nice paper from ICML, the same conference that had those badges uh, from 2015, where it talks about how do you learn to search better than your teacher? And there are some theorems that they prove. Uh, the second question was about, are we going to see things like convolutions and transformers? Sadly, no. Uh, that I, I would argue that convolu uh, let me go back to this um, models class. Convolutions and transformers are essentially special types of these things. This is, I'm going to write TNN, uh, transformers, RNN, recur recurrent neural networks and such things. They're all special types of these things. And um, I, would, I would argue these are uh, specialized enough that they warrant a class of their own. For example, these two things could belong in a class that could say something of the type deep learning for NLP or deep learning for sequences. This could be um, like uh, deep learning for images or things like that. That's it. I do want to, uh, I, I will talk about the general principles of uh, uh, how uh, these models might be trained and spend a bit of time uh, discussing specific kinds of technical ideas that are necessary for training all of these kinds of things and other new model types that are yet to be invented. So this class is not about a particular class of model. The thing is, I, by the way, I don't know if uh, it's obvious here. I have categorized these two things as linear and nonlinear. Categorizing the world into linear or world of functions into linear and nonlinear is like categorizing the, the set of objects in the world into potato and non-potato. <laughs> it is an arbitrary choice. Um, nonlinear is such a massive set that uh, we can basically keep going if we uh, try to encounter every function out there. What is more important is, can you, and the focus of this class also is, can we find general principles that would work irrespective of which nonlinear classifier we are going to have today or tomorrow? So we, this class is about the fundamental principles that uh, we will encounter, we will need to train all of these things. Other questions? Yes. Uh, what is the Sorry, can you? Do... I still didn't hear you. How do you? Uh, how, how much you oh, this. Um, I will come to that. So, the question was, how much programming does this class teach? Is this mostly theory or more programming? I'll come to that question once uh, in a little while. I'll, uh, that's a good question. All right, I can see you want to know more. So we'll encounter different kinds of learning algorithms, but uh, loosely speaking, we'll encounter different families of learning algorithms. Uh, we'll spend a bit of time on this uh, uh, family of algorithms that are called online algorithms. We'll actually spend, we'll encounter only one online algorithm, the perceptron, who's, uh, which was also invented in 1959. 1959 was a good year for machine learning. Uh, and uh, the, the, I, in this protocol for learning, uh, the learner can access one labeled example at a time. Uh, there's a more specific uh, uh, definition of it. Essentially, you have a stream of examples that keep coming in, and you don't get to kind of uh, store them as a batch and do things. You just encounter one at a time. And uh, once you're done, you, once you learn from it, you toss away that example. That's a, that protocol is called online learning. Um, in contrast, there's uh, something called batch learning or batch algorithms um, have a data set. They can do whatever they want with the data set and we'll spend a lot of time on a whole bunch of different batch algorithms. Uh, in my mind, the simplest batch algorithm is the naive base classifier. I don't know why, but sometimes students don't agree with me, um, but we'll spend some time on naive base Support vector machines are a batch algorithm. Uh, neural networks, logistic regression, uh, they're all batch algorithms. Decision trees are batch algorithms. So are the, so is the nearest neighbors classifier. We'll talk about ensembles in particular. A specific kind of an ensemble is the, uh, something called boosting, also a batch algorithm. So much of the successes that you hear about in machine learning 
at least the supervised version of it involves batch algorithms. Um, if time permits, I'll, I'll try to talk about uh, one, one or both of these unsupervised algorithms. Expectation maximization is this really cool meta algorithm that essentially you use to derive new algorithms. And a particular instance of that, a va slight variant of an instance of that is uh, the popular clustering algorithm called k-means that some of you may have heard of. And if time permits, we'll uh, uh, encounter both of them. All right. Um, one important thing is you probably have seen some of these things in the past. Even if you've not taken the prerequisite class, you may have seen some of these in the past. You may have used some of them as black boxes. The goal of this class is to kind of uncover that box, get into the insides of it, try to uh, see how they work, why they work, when they fail, and such things. The uh, important sort of dirty secret to machine learning, and this goes back to this question that uh, came up about uh, when will it fail. The important dirty secret is machine learning succeeds when you are able to represent your data in just the right way. In fact, all the theorems that we will encounter essentially will say, if your data representation is good enough, then learning is easy. If your data representation is not good enough, learning is not easy. Um, one of the biggest advances that has happened in machine learning in the last decade is uh, this idea that you can actually learn these representations from data. The idea that uh, you can treat the problem of learning representations also as a machine learning task. Maybe it's quite possible that any that last sentence that I said made no sense to you. Hopefully at the end of the semester it will. The big one of the big new consensus in machine learning, which is about 10 years old now, is this conference on learning representations. And you may have heard of this problem of learning representation in a different in a different way. You may have heard of neural networks. Neural networks essentially um, are systems that learn good feature representations that you can then use. Convolutional neural networks learn good features for images. Transformers learn good features for sequences. And all of these are uh, important questions that we have essentially um, sort of, we've taken a problem that is really hard, that we don't know how to solve. What is a good representation of data? and decided it's too hard, let's make it also a learning problem. And that somehow has become super successful. If time permits, we'll cover dimensionality reduction. I have said that eight or nine times in the last eight or nine years, so far time has never permitted, uh, but I'm saying that again, uh, there's no harm in being optimistic at the beginning of the semester. Um, all right. The other thing that we'll encounter is uh, this uh, the theory of learning. Actually, I'm going to pause right now, and I just realized that my lab, I forgot to bring my laptop charger. Do any of my TAs have a charger for the Mac? It's a USB-C, but yes. Thank you. This is one of those things that always happens at the first lecture where something always gets lost, and you know, this is, uh, they make it a little challenging because I can't find. Okay, so we'll talk about the theory of machine learning. What does it mean to learn? What does it mean for learning to be successful? And uh, uh, for each of these, we, we'll answer this question in three different ways. We'll talk about online learning where the learner sees examples in a stream and we define success as if it stops making mistakes. I see, keep seeing an example one at a time and I make predictions and I define success as if I can stop making mistakes. And uh, there's a variant of that which talks about minimizing regret. We won't spend time on that. There's another answer to this question. What does it mean to learn? This, uh, this answer takes a fantastic uh, form uh, has a fantastic name called probably approximately correct learning. Um, it's the worst name in my opinion for such a cool idea. Um, the, the theory of uh, learning, pack learning, 
um, is the winner, the person who invented that, is the winner of a Turing Award. And essentially, it's uh, saying after seeing a certain number of examples, uh, the learner with high probability will stop, will uh, make mistakes, will make only a small number of mistakes. Le perfect learning is impossible, but the number of mistakes will go down after a certain time. Another answer to the same question is uh, the, uh, the probabilistic perspective, the Bayesian perspective, we can, where we ask what's the probability distribution over all possible rules or functions uh, that our learner needs to estimate. And each of these is a different, uh, it turns out a different sort of an intellectual answer to the same question. Each answer will give us different learning uh, algorithms. Yes. Yes. Um, it may seem like this is a lot, and I think it is, but I'm going to power through and uh, I'll drag you along. <laughs> uh, this course is not about a particular learning tool. This course is not about PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX or whatever uh, is the latest programming uh, implementation of the ideas. It's not about a particular learning paradigm. This the course is about uh, the, the fundamental concepts and the algorithm, algorithmic ideas that have that kind of power the field. And the hope is at the end of this semester, you'll be able to pull up any of these libraries that you want, and it'll seem familiar to you to the point where you might even be able to start implementing things. That doesn't mean that you will not implement things to answer a question that came up earlier, but it's not about any one particular uh, machine learning library. So what you will learn is a broad theoretical and practical understanding of learning paradigms and learning algorithms. You will learn the ability, you will hopefully uh, acquire the ability to implement learning algorithms. I've been told that uh, at the end of the semester, you will feel like you have implemented a brand new machine learning library of your own. That's how many things you will implement. And uh, along the way, I hope that you will uh, pick up the ability to identify when machine learning can be applied and when it cannot be applied. And when it should be applied, you will know what are the appropriate decisions to make about uh, algorithms, about models, about uh, supervision, about features and such things. And you will also have the right experimental protocol for how to uh, you know, apply machine learning. Questions? So this class officially ends at 1.45, right? Okay, so we have time. Questions? Yes. Where would you, or what would you rank last year in terms of important years for AI? What does that mean? It just seemed like so much happened last year. It always seems like so much happened last year. Every year feels like so much happened. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Um, there's a certain recency bias that I'm unable to get past to be able to answer your question. I feel it's important, but I'm biased because last year is more recent. So I'm gonna kind of, that's my way of not answering the question. <laughs> so the, so far we talked about what you will learn. Let's now move to the more boring part, which is how you learn, which is really all about course information, logistics and such things. <laughs>